STEM education is often criticized in the, or higher education in STEM is often criticized because the advisors only know what it's like to be an academic. Um, a lot of times they've never worked in, 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 in well, a real job <laughs> before and, uh, and they, don't necessarily, uh, they don't necessarily know that much about, uh, about things outside of academia. That's changing, that's not always the case, or that's, that's often not the case, especially in engineering. In engineering you have it quite well uh, compared to your, uh, your colleagues in the natural sciences, um, in my opinion. Uh, so, uh, so, this, so this is a slide from a talk I gave a few weeks ago on unconventional careers. And uh, according to many of your advisors, uh, a job in academia would be considered a, 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 a conventional career. Although this is a, quite a misnomer because um, fewer than 1% of PhDs are employed at R1 research institutions. That's not uh, the case with people who have degrees from UCSD, our um, percentage is higher than that, um, quite a bit higher than that, but among uh, overall in uh, among um, uh, people with PhDs, not many of them are employed at R1 research institutions. I'll take a case study of chemical engineering just because it's this, the, uh, the area that I know best. You can count about 160 ABET accredited programs in the United States. Half of them are PhD granting, so we call those R1 research institutions. Um, about a third, maybe, this is where my, my knowledge is a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, not, not necessarily precise, but my, my impression is about a third are hiring in a given year. Um, and why do they hire? Because you have some faculty turnover like retirement or, uh, or death. Um, and sometimes you have a failed retention. So sometimes a faculty member leaves their position for another university and, uh, and that position opens up. However, it does fill a position somewhere else. So it doesn't add another uh, to the pool. This is kind of like, uh, like steady state. Um, faculty positions are a lot like uh, a lot like orchestral music mu music positions. So when I was uh, in high school, I played the trombone, and and at the time, I wanted to be the uh, the, the lead trombonist in the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. Uh, but what are the odds that uh, that that position is going to turn over any time in the next thirty years? Uh, not, uh, not, not, not so high probability. Academic science is not quite like that because the p number of positions are actually increasing um, because, uh, because of industrial research contracts uh, are increasing. And although the uh, federal budgets for research are not really keeping pace with inflation, although there was a big increase this year, they are actually increasing in terms of of absolute dollars. So, so, so many departments are actually expanding instead of contracting. Uh, and there are more than uh, 1,200 chemical engineering PhDs granted uh, each year. There are about 200 to 300 applicants per position and about 25 new assistant professors start at R1 institutions uh, per year. So, uh, so people do get these jobs. There aren't that many of them. Um, and, uh, but there are a lot of reasons why one might not want this job. Uh, and one reason is that the funding landscape is so competitive. So this is a, from a talk I gave uh, last year on grant writing. And I know you can't read the text here because it's too small, but you can see the big blue part of the pie chart. That's about the fraction of time a, uh, a professor at an R1 spends fundraising that is writing grants and applying for industrial research contracts, doing things related to grants, um, uh, progress reports that are written to agencies, uh, and also um, uh, things like positioning for grants. That is going to the National Institutes of Health or the National Science Foundation to meet with program managers to see how their work fits into the programs that are, uh, that are um, uh, that are run uh, for the purposes of making grants within these various agencies. Another reason why someone, someone might not want to be a professor, well, if you don't love teaching, 
uh, you will not like the fact that you're teaching the same topics pretty much every year. You're reviewing a ton of papers, and uh, although you want to be reviewing your own group's papers, uh, you have to review other group's papers from other universities all over uh, the world. And uh, you, you may like this task, you may, you may not. There are a lot of committees that one must, uh, must sit on. These are, um, uh, these are committees within your department, within the School of Engineering or Physical Sciences or whatever it may be, or, and, uh, and the campus. So for example, I'm on maybe six or seven different committees at any given point uh, during the year. And there are also ad hoc committees that meet only for a month about a particular topic. You have to deal with near constant rejection of grants, papers, uh, PhD applicants who apply to your group but also apply to uh, Stanford and they go there because the, uh, they like eucalyptus trees that thrive in a more moist environment as opposed to a more arid environment that exists here. Uh, you generally need to do a postdoc uh, but not in every field. And there are a lot of postdoc substitutes that uh, engineers in particular can avail themselves of. But in chemical engineering, bioengineering, um, generally fields that are a little bit uh, closer to the biological side tend to require a postdoc. Uh, mechanical engineering, increasingly so. Um, ECE, CSE, it's still pretty rare to do a postdoc. Uh, but um, but it's not it's 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 not totally uncommon or unheard of. The the closing thought about why someone might not want to be a professor is that there are few other careers that have as large a constituency that can make legitimate demands on your time. So your department chair, uh, editors of journals that are asking you for you know submit this review and in seven days, you know, or else what um, program managers uh, within the various granting agencies that you're applying to will make demands on your time, not just for progress reports, but also for reviewing grant proposals that they get from other principal investigators at other universities and journalists. So journalists, uh, this is generally a, a good thing. Somebody wants to uh, disseminate your work to a wider audience. You may, uh, you may do interviews with, uh, with journalists and uh, members of the media. What does a professor do at an R1? Okay, so we've decided because uh, you're in this room, you're either interested in this topic or, 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 or want, to, want, to, want a career in academia. Um, Research is about, these are very rough numbers taken from uh, the only career that I know really well, which is my own. And no, I don't punch card these times, but this is about, about what, I, what I imagine. Things related to research, 65% of my time. Um, and that is writing publications, working with students to write their, uh, their manuscripts, Applying for grants. This is a huge. Takes a huge amount of time to uh, to take the to to raise the uh, the amount of money that it takes to run a research group in an R1 institution, which is somewhere between uh, ten to the five and and uh, ten to the six dollars uh, per year, uh, and um, also presentations at conferences. So for example, American Institute of Chemical Engineers or the Materials Research Society, American Society of Mechanical Engineers, American Chemical Society, and so forth. Um, and also institutional seminars. So, uh, so every time you see a, a seminar speaker that gets invited to UCSD uh, or wherever you happen to be, uh, that person spends, you know, considers it an honor and to be invited to that place, they get to write it on their, uh, on their CV um, because they're disseminating their research to the wider, uh, the wider academic community. Uh, patents are a very small part of the research uh, portfolio, but for some, uh, for some uh, PIs, that is principal investigators, professors, faculty members, this is actually quite a, quite a serious uh, uh, endeavor is protecting their inventions. Teaching is about 25% of, the, uh, of the, the, the time that most 
uh, research active faculty spend in their uh, in their their day-to-day -day, uh, work lives this is teaching courses it also includes to some extent mentoring although mentoring is kind of tied with publications in the research column so these are not exclusive categories this is mentoring of grad students and undergrads in the in the research lab and postdocs and then the final component does it add up to okay i'm good yeah so service is 10 percent. and what is service service technically is uh, like this activity that I'm doing now. So for example, I was the faculty coordinator. I am the faculty coordinator of this uh, grad student and postdoc seminar series, and I consider this a, a service activity. So it, it's something that's not strictly speaking teaching, although there is a teaching component of when I actually give a talk, but when I get somebody from outside to give the talk, that's that I would consider a service activity. Um, so committee, so a committee could be an exam committee or committee on recruitment or um, uh, what goes into the graduate or undergraduate curriculum. Those are also committees and student exams. Uh, service could also be service to the scientific community. So that is uh, journal, working with journals, perhaps being a guest editor of a journal, doing, uh, doing review work for journals, proposal uh, reviews editing of, uh, of, of other types of publications like books and so forth, um, although that also has to do with research, maybe, um, also conference organizations. So anytime you go to a conference of your professional society, uh, those, each individual symposium was actually organized by some team of, of professors, and usually the youngest professor on that team did 90% of the work uh, to, at least that's my experience, in, uh, in putting these, uh, these sessions together. And it takes a lot of work. You know, sometimes you, you collect 200 or 300 paper abstracts that you have to go through and select to who gets the talks and, and so on, and that takes uh, quite a lot of time. There are a lot of teaching positions and so academic positions that are not research active faculty in R1. There are myriad positions like this. Uh, high school teaching. So high school teaching can be broken down into uh, for uh, for uh, uh, into into private schools that tend to pay less, but perhaps don't uh, necessarily need the same certification, depending on the jurisdiction, as public schools in which the. Uh, the certification varies by district or municipality or state. Um, you have to be prepared if you're going to teach high school to be a disciplinarian, more so than you would in most college classes, where maybe you might say, listen up, you're generally not sending people to the principal's office. A community college. Community colleges are uh, known, as, uh, known as having like some of the best instructors. Uh, generally, like when I hear from uh, from uh, students transferring from community colleges, so these people are really committed. A lot of uh, a lot of uh, of my friends have successful careers um, here. They attract excellent instructors. Um, the problem is in engineering is that unless it's CSE or ECE or MECE, they generally don't have upper division engineering curriculum at the associate's degree level. So you're generally teaching introductory courses or basic science courses in math or math, statistics, chemistry, uh, computer science, biology, and uh, and so on. There are also teaching positions at R1 institutions. So uh, so. People who have probably twice the teaching load of a research active faculty member, uh, a teaching professor. Um, these, except in certain places, are generally not tenure track. Uh, but the UC system is different. Most of our uh, lecturers in engineering um, are actually tenure track. They call this a lecturer with potential security of employment or a lecturer with security of employment, which just means teaching professor, and, uh, and these people are really highly committed to the, uh, the educational um, uh, mission of the university. Not to say that the research active faculty aren't, but they don't have to do this huge amount of grant, uh, grant writing and uh, kind of the, the academic uh, 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 rat race bit because they can focus their efforts on teaching, and they're generally very good at it. So. Um, these areas I don't know as much about 
of course, as uh, R1 research active uh, faculty, and I thought it might be instructive to go back in time uh, six years and show you a talk that I gave to my postdoc lab on June 20th, 2012. Um, I modified it a little bit, um, but just because some of the things I said were fresh at the time and are still pretty, uh, pretty relevant now. So this was before I applied to this job. Um, th this was in a, the, the job posting was for advanced energy technologies in the engineering school at UCSD. It was not specifically tied to the nanoengineering department. It was actually an interdepartmental search, which was, which was made up from, uh, roughly speaking, the chairs of each of the six engineering departments at UCSD, and that was the committee that, that did this search. As such, it didn't show up when I searched indeed.com or acs.org or achy.org or, or my normal search terms. I actually had to email the, uh, the chair of the department at the time to, uh, to ask about another position that was posted, uh, and, but, but it was posted for a mid-career hire. And I said, is there also a position open for a junior uh, hire? And he said, not for the position that was posted, but there's this other position that is hiring at the assistant professor level. So ironically, I spent 100 hours on Indeed.com and Monster and whatever for all the academic job postings um, and message boards and, and so on. But the job that I eventually got, in fact, the only offer that I got was a position that never came up in any search. What are the parts of an academic job application? There's a cover letter that explains what, who you did, who you are, what you did, uh, okay. um, and, uh, and what research you would like to do in the, in the future. Your, uh, your curriculum vita, your C, I will not use that word again in the talk, your CV, uh, your research statement, which is usually three proposals that you are going to execute once you get uh, the faculty position. The teaching statement, so this is what courses can you teach. There is only one correct answer to this, that is every course in the curriculum. Even if you can't, you do not want this to be a liability on your job application because you can learn <laughs> even if it takes a hundred hours a week when you start your position to teach you, teach a course you've never taken you can learn how to teach it uh, in the uc system and many other public school systems you have to include a diversity statement so what is what are you going to do to increase the representation of uh, of of individuals who are underrepresented in uh, in science and engineering. Letters of recommendation, you need at least three of these. They have to come from, uh, if you did a postdoc, your postdoc advisor, your PhD advisor, and perhaps one or two senior collaborators at one of your institutions. I had a very strong uh, relationship with my undergraduate advisor as well, so I got his uh, two, although um, I'm not sure how much weight it carried compared to uh, compared to my more senior, uh, or mentors that I had when I was more senior. This was my cover letter, and I don't care that you can't read it, to read the text, because I don't want you to, because <laughs> it's uh, a little uh, probably embarrassing by now. Uh, but you, a couple of key features I want to point out that, that you should notice. It's uh, not quite two pages. Um, you put it on university letterhead, wherever you happen to be. Um, the, uh, I put my website on here. Having a website like a dossier, like an, like an e-dossier is a very useful thing. And this is actually true for any job you get, because while there are some requirements that uh, recruiters say about resume has to be one page, one page only, it's actually quite easy for a recruiter to just click a link to your website and see the beautiful, um, uh, kind of digital dossier that you've constructed with images from your work, almost like a digital portfolio. 
Um, so you say, you know, what position you're applying for, then it's kind of semi-autobiographical. The cover letter is a little bit like an abstract to your, uh, to your research proposals and your teaching, uh, your teaching statement. Uh, so this is, this is, these are the only two pages uh, in, my, uh, in my cover letter. The CV, so this is the first and last page because I wanted to show uh, kind of the, the vitals that go, uh, that go up here. Um, you say where you did your, your short statement on research interests, um, education, so where you did all your, your degrees. Uh, some section on honors and awards, some section on teaching. So um, most of you will have done some kind of TA ships during your graduate or postdoc uh, education, or sometimes even undergraduate education. Then you list your publications. There are uh, competing thoughts on um, whether or not you should list things in chronological order or reverse chronological order. I prefer things in reverse chronological order because I want to know what the most important stuff is when I see a faculty applicant. And maybe some, a, a poster that you did as an undergrad is not necessarily going to be what your faculty research proposals are, are on. And then this is a, a page break here. And then I just said like service to the community at the time. I got some journal articles to review as a postdoc from various journals. And then um, I was chair of the graduate student and postdoc council um, in grad school. So I considered that a pretty significant service uh, activity. So I listed that. Probably nobody got this far, um, but there it is. Those are the, the key elements. Research proposals. This is the first and last page of my seven page research statement. Um, I asked, uh, it seems like the lucky number is seven, like lucky number seven. Um, it, you ask people, how long should your research statement be? No more than seven pages. That might be long to some people. Um, they're not going to, I, I think that that faculty candidates get so consumed with anxiety about these specific things, like exactly how long should this be? Uh, and nobody really cares. Like, it shouldn't be 10, it shouldn't be two. Uh, somewhere in between is probably fine. Seven is good, because seven is, seven is about the length of a short grant proposal. So if you can show how, uh, how well you, um, are, are positioned to write grants to funding agencies should you get your job. This is kind of like, a, like an audition for grant, grant writing. So there's kind of a, a little bit of an abstract here, this little preamble. And then I had three topics um, that were basically extensions of my, my postdoc and grad work. If I had to do this all over again, my proposals would have been 10 times better. No matter what happens, the first time you write a proposal, it's going to stink. So, uh, so write them early. There might even be a position that you don't think you're going to get that might open randomly, like say the spring before you're going to apply in earnest in the fall, and just apply to that so you have something on file that you can work off of when you're ready to apply for, uh, for real. Um, okay, I'll get back to the research statements when I got some feedback from some of my, uh, the people that I interviewed with. Teaching statement. Teaching statement, when I look back at what I wrote, uh, you know, seven years ago, this was in the, this is in the summer of 2011 when I wrote this, and I kind of shudder, like, one, how far I've deviated from actual teaching approaches that I put in here, and also the arrogance of it. My teaching philosophy, uh, you know, I TA'd like three courses, and it's not enough to develop a teaching philosophy. And I really don't like this language when I hear, when I hear it from uh, somebody who has never taught a class by themselves, how can you develop a philosophy about something? So just kind of be mindful of the fact that when you're talking to a room of, of faculty members, some of whom have been teaching for like 40 years, that maybe they're, they might actually call, be able to call it a philosophy. Um, also in here, there's nothing about uh, 
evidence-based education strategies. And this is uh, something that I just didn't know that much about. I wasn't that comfortable talking about it. Um, that is things like peer learning, flipped classroom, active learning approaches, online education, things that uh, uh, use of technology in classes. You know, I think I said something in here about liking to write with chalk as opposed to PowerPoint. Uh, it, it, it really, very few faculty applicants will actually acknowledge that there is research on how people learn. And if you can put something in there like that, uh, that gives you an advantage in the eyes of the people in the audience who, who study education or who know, uh, who know that there is a literature on, uh, on STEM education. Okay, so uh, there were 13 months. Uh, the process takes a really long time. Um, I started writing my proposals in May of 2011. I applied to a throwaway position, one that I was sure I was not going to get, but maybe if I got an inter interview, that would have been that would have been great. It's just you know sometimes positions open at odd times, um, and I applied to it, and that way I had something in writing because it's always good to start with a uh, with a with a draft of something. So made did this proposal, the whole application package, sent it in. And I knew I basically knew I was burning it. I did it only for the experience. You know, they say in entrepreneurship, fail fast and fail cheap. In August, postings start to appear, and they appear uh, in the places that you look for any job. Um, Indeed.com is a good place to look. Um, uh, if you are in uh, my field, so chemistry, chemical engineering, material science, um, acs.org, uh, or the equivalent professional society website, so IEEE or ASME or, and, and so forth. Look, for individual, look at individual departments or university HR websites. Often these are places that will post something that maybe the person in charge of putting that advertisement didn't put it in the places that you look, and that's totally possible. But it might be on their, on their uh, departmental website. September through December were deadlines. Physical sciences and uh, phys physical sciences and natural sciences, so chemistry, biology, tend to be earlier in the year. Engineering tends to be later. December through February, you get invitations to uh, to interview. December through March are the interviews. My interview at UCSD uh, was Pi Day 2012, 314. I'll never forget that. And March through May uh, are the decisions. And uh, as difficult as this is, don't take the rejections uh, personally um, because it's just a numbers game. There are just so many applicants for each one of these uh, positions. In June, um, I got a final contract. In May, I heard that I was going to get a contract. In June, I got the contract. Um, I remember exactly where I was in May when I got the email from, uh, from the former department chair. I was spin coating some polymer film, and I just checked my email during the, whatever, the 90 second spin coat. And there it was. And then I just dropped what I was doing, didn't clean up my experiment, and I, going home for the day. No, just kidding, I didn't do that. I think I, think I did go home early, though. Um, and uh, so don't take rejections personally. So, yep. Usually five to 10 per position. Sometimes there are more than one position, though. Um, some, I applied to a department that, that had phone interviews with probably 20 people, then they invited 10 and they had four positions open. So actually once at that particular place, I'm like, oh, you know, it's almost 50-50. Of course, I didn't get an offer there. <laughs> um, in fact, so I'll, I, I, I guess I have a slide on this and I'll, 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 um, I'll continue, it might be, oh yeah, here it is, okay. So um, overall, I applied to 23 positions 
uh, I do not, I would not suggest applying to this few. This is not very many. <laughs> um, I had seven interviews and one offer. Not only did I have one offer, but I had six rejections in a row before finally getting the offer. I, uh, I'm also in what you would call a dual career couple. Uh, my wife is also a, a, a PhD postdoc scientist um, and now in, uh, now in the, the business track. Uh, and that influenced my deci decision on where to apply because these 23 places had to be places that uh, would serve uh, her needs as well. They call this the two-body problem because it's like physics -y and yeah. Uh, I applied in chemistry departments. So my undergrad and grad degrees are in chemistry. My postdoc was in a chemical engineering department. So I figured that I could apply to both types of places. They didn't like me in chemistry departments. I had one interview out of 13 um, applications. The subfield searches, so that is to say somebody asked for anything other than materials chemistry, like they asked for organic or uh, inorganic or whatever. Some, some of those postings were in desirable places and I applied to them. That was a complete waste of time because I had I had no chance. So the one interview that I got was at a, for a posting specifically for materials chemistry and that, that made sense. Uh, but I did not get an offer there. Uh, in chemical engineering, I had a lot more success. I had four interviews out of six uh, applications. Why is it 13 chemistry compared to six chemical engineering? It's because every school has a chemistry department but a much smaller minority have a chemical engineering department. That's true with physics and mechanical engineering too, or biology and bioengineering. And I had zero out of four offers. <laughs> um, I will put material science and engineering and nanoengineering in the same category. Uh, so I had um, two interviews out of four places that I applied, uh, and I had one out of two offers. One is all you need. <laughs> um, in fact, if I had all seven offers from everywhere that I interviewed, I still would have come to UCSD. This is advice that doesn't apply to you, uh, but if you have friends in the natural sciences, uh, Ask them to consider rebranding themselves as engineers because it is a lot easier to get a, a, a job outside of academia doing engineering than it is to get a job outside of academia in biology with a degree in biology doing biology. It, I'm sorry, it just happens to be true. Engineers engineers eat nails and can do can do a lot of stuff and generally do engineering once they get their job as a result the applicant pools for engineering positions even though there aren't as many engineering departments tend to be smaller so if you are interested in a career in, in academia as an engineer you have an advantage compared to your friend in chemistry it's it's just the way it is even though there are fewer departments Consider applying very broadly uh, to adjacent fields. So if you're a material scientist, uh, consider applying to mechanical engineering. If you're a material science doing biomaterials, apply to bioengineering and oftentimes to chemical engineering too, which are often combined with bioengineering departments. For example, um, uh, NC State, CU Boulder are like this. Sometimes chemi and material science departments are combined like uh, UC Irvine, and to some extent that's sort of the case in nanoengineering at UCSD, which functions as both the nanoengineering and chemical engineering department. Um, there are other cases. I, I tend not to know as much about ECE and CSE, but that's also a case where there's a lot of overlap, where if you're a computer scientist, oftentimes so, you know, some of the, the, uh, the best computer work is being done in a, in a department that's formally called electrical engineering, as, as, as you know, and vice versa. 
Okay, uh, a, a, few, a few things that faculty committees um, uh, want to see, and, uh, and, uh, and if you exhibit these, uh, these qualities, you are uh, more likely to get an interview or an offer. So for an interview, um, publications, that is like quantity and quality. You know, you can, you can think of, of certain publications as having a certain, in, in a particular field, having a certain pre-factor, you know, like uh, science is worth X number of points. You know, nobody really, really runs the publications through it through through a uh, you know an algorithm but they will look at the publication list uh, and see where your author or where you're listed on the author list make sure to bold your name so that they can see where you are um, the proposals are important um, I wouldn't expect the faculty uh, to read these with a fine-tooth comb unless uh, unless it's the committee members and, and then unless you're on the short list but make sure to have really good figures uh, and make sure that y at least one of your proposals is kind of a moonshot, not just uh, what you did as a postdoc or as a grad student. The letters are, are really uh, important. Um, you want to ask people who will write two packed pages, two or three packed pages, you know, single spaced, 11 point font, half inch margins that just know you really well and want to go to bat, bat for you. It's, uh, you know, if there's some, say you worked with a Nobel Prize winner at some point, but maybe they only know you enough to write half a paragraph worth, probably not worth it. Or you can offer to draft the letter for them this did not happen in my case. Um, faculty letters are a lot different from fellowship letters. Generally, the people you ask uh, will write it themselves. Um, I was never asked from any of my letter writers for this, for, for, for the faculty position, you know, to draft the letter or even bullet it. They just wanted the CV, the due date, um, and they did the rest. Uh, getting an offer. So when, if you get an interview, uh, how, what differentiates one person from the other? Uh, and unfortunately, this is not an exact science. Um, the first is fit. Second is also fit. Third characteristic being fit. What do I mean by fit? Well, there may be a hole in a particular research field in the department that may be one person in the applicant pool fills better than the other one, or in the interview pool fills better than the other people. Uh, it may also be that, um, that one person, uh, that, that there are so many, that one person really stands out as being particularly well aligned with an existing uh, strength of the, of the department. Uh, so it could go both ways. Um, a lot of this is idiosyncratic. What if you or one of your competitors has a particularly strong voice on the, in, on the, in the faculty committee and you, somebody that you've impressed really goes to bat for you when it comes time for the faculty to get together to make an offer? That can go a, that can go a really long way toward convincing other people in the room that you or one of your competitors is the right candidate. So a little bit more about proposals. So you'll be giving in an interview a proposal talk. So you'll be, you'll be giving a general talk about your past research and you'll also be giving a proposal talk about what you'd like to do in the future. Sometimes they call it a vision talk. Uh, and you want to, the, the perfect faculty proposal has fundamental, you know, good fundamental stuff in it. If it's chemical engineering, it has some good transport phenomena and thermodynamics and, uh, and, and, and kinetics, uh, but it also has some, some, uh, some long reach to a societal problem that not many people are looking at. Um, say, uh, water remediation or, or you know, some, something that's going to differentiate you when you apply for funding, but something that's sufficiently, but has fundamental, a, fund, a strong fundamental core 
that will excite the, uh, you know, the graybeards in the audience who love to derive equations. Develop effective arguments uh, for, these, for this research. Do practice talks. Um, talk to your research, give your practice talk to your research group before you, give an, uh, before you give an interview. This is true for any job, not just for faculty jobs. This was a very interesting, uh, this was a very interesting comment that I got from uh, one of my former uh, postdoc colleagues who got an offer uh, a couple years before I did. And you would think that a university is the place where you want to kind of show off how intellectual you are, but um, this it's it could be a it could be a turnoff too if you uh, if if you lack some humility and you say that this is my teaching philosophy and research philosophy and you you give the impression that you know a lot more than the people who have been doing this job for five to fifty years. Um, that could be a problem. So, you know, it may help to stick uh, a little bit to the facts, but know them really well. And finally, if you, you know, you get a rejection, everybody gets rejections uh, constantly. Uh, I had a big grant rejected yesterday. Uh, but you wouldn't want to be at a place that wouldn't have you as a member. So if you get rejected, it's not meant to be. Um, it's, uh, you know, if they don't want you, you don't want them. Uh, this is interesting. This was my interview itinerary. I know the, the font is small. That's intentional. Um, it can be really exhausting on the day of the interview. So this had, I don't know how many people this, I met. One, two, three, four, a lot. Probably 20, 23 people. And over the course of seven interviews, I met with um, over 100 faculty for at least 30 minutes each. Um, one good piece of advice I got was to memorize one technical uh, and one non-technical fact or question for everyone you are going to meet. Uh, and the reason you memorize it, and this is a very subtle thing, but it will be embarrassing if you don't know it, is if you write the question on your printed out itinerary, one of the faculty members will say, can I see that for a second? I want to see where you're going next before they take you to the next office. And then they can read the notes that you wrote on there. So memorize them, memorize them. Also, uh, they will, it, you'll be in this position. Um, you have to ask for bathroom breaks. Be your own advocate here because they will forget. They'll all, the, every single one of them will bring you over time and say, oh, we're way out of time. I got to run you to, to my colleague's office. So you have to be your own advocate here. Also ask for water or bring it with you. Um, and, uh, and this is true, this is true for, um, for any job interview where you have some kind of itinerary ahead of time. So most uh, R&D interviews will be, um, will be pretty involved. You know, it could be half day or full day, uh, full day affairs. Um, anything else I want to say about this? I think we're good. Oh yeah, you get to meet a lot of really cool uh, people. So like John Goodenough here, I had lunch with John Goodenough. Anyone know who he is? So John Goodenough um, basically invented the lithium ion battery uh, and he's in his 90s now and he's super, super uh, cool guy to get to spend time with. Um, and, and that's going to be true, you know, anywhere you go, there are going to be some really, uh, you know, really important people that, that you wouldn't ordinarily get a chance to meet. Yep. Brian, how do you differentiate when you get subject Murray, who is on the core committee and who is not? That's a good question. So the question is, how do you know who's on the selection committee and who's not? Um, at the point of the interview, you generally won't know, but at once people have been called for the interview, uh, the committee has done its job. And then the full faculty usually vote on the final person. The full faculty vote, but the chair gets to make the decision and you will know who the chair is. So the chair makes the decision at most places. The chair has dictatorial control over hiring in the department. So they generally don't go against the wishes of the faculty, uh, and it depends on, on what the bylaws of the department are, but usually there's a vote, and then the chair sends the decision to the dean, 
the dean makes the, de the decision and then somebody in the president or chancellor's office um, you know, just signs off on whatever the dean, dean's decision is and so forth. So, yeah. Is that like one, like, is that a, a different question or fact for every person or is it, are, like, are they tailored to the individual? Each, qu each question is tailored to the individual person. This was the most involved interview because at this particular place I had interviews in both the chemical engineering and mechanical engineering uh, departments. Uh, this is a, a, a phrase attributed um, to a counterculturalist in the 60s that don't trust anyone over 30. Um, so they are interviewing you, but you are also interviewing them. And this is true for any job, not just in academia. Uh, and they'll tell you things that, when, that should they decide to make you an offer, you'll think back to and say, oh, they really wanted me. So every one of these quotations came from someone in a department that ultimately rejected me. You were our top candidate. Your application floated right to the top. Chair. The chair makes the final decision here. What, what do I have to tell you to make you decide to come here instead of blank? What's the matter you? I'm pushing hard for you. You're number one with me, a number one or two with every other member of the faculty. Dean, we would love to have you here at Watsamata University. I'm not a superstar, you're a superstar. I'm not gonna say it's all bullshit, but it's all bullshit. <laughs> uh, the little things matter. Um, send administrators that spent uh, hours and hours and hours organizing your visit. Uh, this is true for any job, not just academia. Send notes to faculty. Um, even if the administrators don't officially get to make the decision, they're still involved in the process and the people who make the decision are in contact with these people. Um, and, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's karma. Send notes to faculty. Uh, thank you for taking the time to meet with me. Don't email them all at once. Be specific. I enjoyed hearing your thoughts on such, such and such, but you know, be, don't send the same thing to every faculty member because they talk. Uh, send your letter writers a gift, whether you get an offer or not. <laughs> Uh, academic science and engineering is a small world, so oftentimes you'll go to a conference and there's one candidate who's interviewed at every school and uh, faculty will, will talk about these people. This is also true in any job, not just in academics. Um, and then my advisor told me after I got six rejections in a row and was hanging uh, by the skin of my teeth, um, to not having a job for the following year. If you have to reapply again next year, it's nothing over the course of a career and your arguments will be much stronger. Uh, rejection, 99.5% of applicants by definition will get rejected. Don't take it personally. It's all about the fit. Uh, think of all the things, suppose this is the last year you're applying, or you say, this was such a terrible experience, I'm never, I'm never going out for academic positions again. One, I would say, I would say don't give up. Also, uh, also, there are many instances of people who have had successful careers doing R&D in, uh, in industry or, or a national lab who have, uh, who have decided to go back into academia, and at that point they have a completely different set of skills that is uh, in, in oftentimes really desirable for um, engineering departments. Think of all the things that you won't have to endure. Uh, if, if, if you had your, your heart set on an academic position and you didn't get it, or, or you're going to postpone the idea or just not, not do it, um, think of all the things you won't have to endure, and that's constant rejection. It's, it's, it's pretty bad in academia, um, legitimate claims of others uh, on your time, 
uh, and outside of academia, you will make more money and get your research and your work into the real world uh, faster than you will in academia where you're working on problems that are oftentimes so basic that it could take 10 or 20 years or never for them to start getting out in the world and helping people. Whereas if you're doing R&D uh, or working at a startup or something, the horizons are a lot closer and you, can, you get a lot more satisfaction um, out of that. Uh, if you get an offer, a miracle has happened. Uh, don't accept it right away. If you're super lucky to have more than one, you can use it as leverage for uh, salary, start date, lab space, spousal employment. Uh, get things in writing. <laughs> uh, because you may never have this much leverage again. Uh, with that, uh, now that I've that's kind of from the uh, from the applicant side, and I have one slide on from the uh, from the employer side. The uh, the whole package, somebody who does teaching, research, everything well, is really hard to find. Um, usually, some compromises uh, will be made. Um, if I were an applicant for any job, I would use the sharpest arrow in my quiver to, uh, to focus on that. Um, so your best skills, sell selling yourself as a product. Research proposals are generally too safe. Try to make at least one moonshot. Um, when answering questions, I heard that uh, I got defensive and didn't keep up my energy, for example. Um, and I see that in faculty applicants as well. Um, I rarely find evidence of data-informed teaching methodologies. People just say, uh, chalkboard is better than PowerPoint. Funding strategies are not appropriately targeted. So people say, oh, I'm going to apply to NSF and DOD and NIH to fund this idea. Well, yeah, every single person is going to say that. Uh, Multi-stage interviews are end up working out better. Um, so that is like Skype or phone before uh, before a uh, before an in-person interview and turn yourself into a product for any job you apply to um, you there has to be something that you do better than anybody else and then focus on that uh, aspect so uh, with that uh, i will thank you for your attention i know i've taken up basically all the time um, but i'm happy to take like one or two short questions thanks